Hello and welcome everybody uh, to the 40 Method 40 in Wakanda user group. Today is October 12th, 2016. Um, I'd like to send out a, a special uh, congratulations to the uh, the Cubs. They, they uh, apparently won a, uh, uh, a baseball game last night. They're moving ahead, hopefully to the World Series. Cubs are one of the teams from here in Chicago. They were playing the Giants uh, from, uh, from San Francisco last night. And uh, apparently the, the team got together and, and huddled for warmth after the game there. So um, uh, all, all good uh, congratulations to, uh, to them and their fans. Uh, and, uh, and Jim, this is uh, only mildly pointed at you. <laughs> but uh, today for the agenda, um, we'll, uh, we'll have a, a bit of news about 40 Method and talk about 40 Method for a moment, and then we'll have some news about 4D from Jim Subcheck and Brian Young. Um, we'll uh, hopefully have an update from Ricardo Mello on uh, what's happening with Wakanda. He has a bit of a scheduling conflict today, so we hope to see him a little bit later on. Um, we will have the 4D iNug e-digest from Ed Hammond. Uh, we'll have a, a Hey 4D segment from myself, uh, where I uh, suggest a, a potentially a new feature for 4D. Um, and then we'll have our uh, special topic. Uh, this will be a really exciting one for everyone, uh, talking about cloud-based storage with 4D and S3, Amazon Web Services. Um, this will, uh, we'll, we'll see that from Bruno Legay in Paris. And uh, then we'll get some, some questions and answers. I'm sure we'll have a few. For, uh, for Bruno and talk about our next meeting on December 7th, 2016, and uh, we'll have another Bruno, uh, Bruno Raymakers. Um, so moving on, uh, my name is Brent Raymond. I organize the 40 Method 40 in Wakanda user group. Uh, we have a website at 40method.com. Come check it out. You can actually see a historical list and, and videos of all of our previous presentations and some uh, some demos of code there and uh, other interesting stuff. Uh, we have a, uh, an email address, 40method at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out to us for any reasons, suggestions for uh, future meeting topics uh, or otherwise. Uh, 40 Method is a user group uh, that we put together to combine efforts with other users around the world uh, and bring together a scattered community of developers and users of 40 and Wakanda. Uh, we stream all of our meetings now with YouTube Live. Welcome to YouTube Live. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, to allow people to participate from anywhere. Uh, we record all the meetings and presentations to be viewed again uh, later on. You can share them with all your friends and family. And uh, we are trying to provide fresh new content and exposure for all, all users and developers everywhere. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a great thing for, uh, <clears throat> for all the presentations in the past, which previously were on uh, Google Hangouts. Now all things uh, apparently must evolve or go away. In this case, uh, Google Hangouts has uh, been transitioned into something called YouTube Live. Um, which has forced us to change a little bit of the way that we take questions uh, for for these presentations while they're while they're actually happening. Um, we have tried to set up a, a, a new approach to submitting questions uh, via the forty uh, subreddit on Reddit. Um, we actually have our own subreddit called Four D Apps, and there's a post on there uh, called Cloud Based Storage with Four D and S Three. And it's the 4D method meeting discussion live thread. So if you'd like, uh, you can post questions and comments up on uh, Reddit, uh, and uh, and we will be monitoring that during the presentation in this meeting. Um, you can also, uh, we have recently found, uh, post questions in the dedicated, the actual root YouTube web page. So you can go there. You can post them up on on Reddit, and uh, either way, we'll be trying to keep an eye on them. Um, there is the, uh, the URL there, but also from the 4D Method site, you'll, there's a link to post questions on Reddit. Uh, 
Um, a bit more 4D method news. Our last meeting has already had over 500 views on YouTube and counting. I, I haven't checked today, but it's, uh, it's, it's been thunderously popular. Uh, there's a link to it here. Uh, again, all these slides are available for download from 4dmethod.com. Um, but definitely go check out this, uh, this previous presentation that Tomas Mao did on uh, the, the new capabilities with V16 for uh, uh, handling uh, uh, multi-threaded processing. Um, and, and don't take it from me, perhaps. Uh, take it from David Adams, whose uh, who's NUG post that I'm sure Ed will mention later on was entitled, Go Watch Tomas Mal's Presentation Now. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we, we've got links to that uh, uh, NUG post uh, on our website. And, uh, and it is easy enough to find just by Googling uh, David Adams and Tomas Mao's presentation. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we've, uh, we've been really happy that uh, everyone has uh, had a lot of feedback from our last meeting and, uh, and look forward to more feedback uh, from, from this meeting today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll kick it over to Jim Sobchak and Brian Young uh, for some news from 4D Central. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Um, thank you Brent and Ed as always for organizing these meetings for um, asking us to participate. Uh, Brent, thank you for that not so subtle dig about the Giants. Um, here in Silicon Valley we're pretty much in mourning for, uh, for the, the abrupt end of the season that came last night. But they had a really good season and uh, uh, being the good sports that we are, we all are here, we'll pull for the Chicago Cubs going forward. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we're as excited as you are about Bruno's uh, presentation today on storage in the cloud with 4D and S3. So that should be really interesting and a topic that we don't usually talk about. Um, so that should be really fun. Um, just to echo Brent's sentiments about um, the positive feedback on Thomas Mall session at the last uh, meeting. We've got a lot of uh, private emails saying how great it was. Of course, the iNug was just swamped with uh, very positive comments and uh, it's clear that uh, v in V16 messaging will be one of the many features for upgrading to V16. So um, thank you all for your comments. And please do see the video if you haven't seen it yet, the one that uh, Brent just alluded to. Uh, since our last 40 meeting in August, uh, we've had a couple of huge releases. Uh, V15R5 was shipped on September 14th. Of course, this will be the last R release before uh, V16. And we also opened the beta program on September 28th for V16. So we hope that all of our partners will take advantage of, uh, of, the, of the beta program, download it, take it for a test run, because your input on the features and performance will be um, very important to us and determine how successful the beta program is. So, uh, so far, everything's going great. Um, and I think you'll be really pleased with, with the state that that beta is in. It's just so far along. And when V16 releases, it'll be one of the most stable releases we've ever had, if not the most stable release. So uh, a lot of things happening with, uh, with our technology here now. So as far as uh, business in uh, 2016, we wrapped up Q3. I'm extremely happy to report that uh, two th two 2016 sales to date are well ahead of our projections. Uh, we're exceeding our targets both in the US and globally. Um, as well as year-over-year -year targets uh, as compared to 2015. So uh, we're really happy with uh, the way um, maintenance is selling, OEM stuff is happening. So uh, yeah, it's been a really, really good year for 4D. Um, and on that note, just a reminder, as, uh, as far as sales go, December 16th uh, will be the last day for those of you who need V14 licenses to actually make those purchases. After uh, December 16th, uh, you will no longer be able to purchase a V14. And um, from a marketing perspective, we're gearing up for a World Tour 2017. Um, a lot of work in front of us. About six months down the road, we, we're whittling down the last few cities we're going to um, we're going to attend, and then we'll have uh, go over the dates. And we hope to have the cities and dates out as soon as possible, so you can all mark your calendars, and we'll see you at the city uh, nearest you. Um, let's see, uh, just a couple of things. Finally, um, Partner Central news section. I think I mentioned this at the last meeting. We are putting fresh content on Partner Central, the news section on the right. 
So please uh, watch for that. And we're trying to put new and interesting information up on that. And we're getting some feedback from uh, some of you partners about the solutions page, 40.com. Uh, we want to make sure that you've updated your partner profiles so that when you're on this, when um, a 40 customer who is in need of a developer comes on to 40.com, they can look in your area and uh, do a radius search, maybe 50 miles from where they're at, and find a developer. And if you're there, they're going to give you a call. So uh, I can guarantee you we get a lot of calls for, from people looking for developers. And that's the first place they look before they call us. They say, do you have anything on your website where I can look for a developer? So make sure that your information is updated so that it's all up there on um, the solution search page. It's one of the great advantages of being a partner. And that's all I have for 4D from my side. Uh, Brent, are you ready for me, or uh, I, I didn't look at the slides this morning? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I guess I would like to just highlight a few of the, uh, the features from the uh, R5 and the 16 beta afterwards. But go ahead and and uh, let us uh, let us know what go, you got there. Uh, I'll go on. The 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 betas and the uh, and R5 are more important. Let's uh, let's talk about those features. Okay. All right. Um, so humble. Uh, <laughs> the uh, so yeah, um, really exciting uh, things happening with R five and sixteen. Um, as we know, with the uh, with the R releases, uh, sixteen is actually R six basically. So uh, all of these R five features are rolled into the sixteen release, which uh, also has its own uh, impressive list itself. But uh, with uh, with R five, we're we're getting preemptive forty language. Uh, asynchronous messaging between processes. Uh, that's the uh, call form and worker processes that uh, that Tomas had uh, demoed for us in the last meeting. Um, the <clears throat> the final de developer edition uh, for 64-bit on OS 10 uh, Max, uh, 40 Write Pro, new pagination and printing features, uh, application sleep for clients, which is just uh, tremendous for anyone that has a, a large user base uh, in the client server setup. I know that uh, our users here at the museum will really appreciate that. It stays, uh, the application stays connected even if your machine goes to sleep uh, and wakes back up again. <clears throat> um, a single sign-on user authentication, which is tremendous and faster es execution of SQL outer joins and, and, and more things. That's just in the R build, R released. And uh, with V16, we'll have a, a revised cache manager. Uh, and again, uh, more development in the preemptive multi-threading side, uh, namely the preemptive 40 web server, which is huge, uh, and thread safe XML and H HTTP client commands. Which will be uh, which will be a good thing. I know we're all starting to rely on uh, on those uh, commands, those new commands that we've had in the, we got in the past few years have been uh, tremendously uh, useful, and um, we'll see a bit more uses of them later today with uh, with Bruno, I'm sure, or potential uses, anyways. Uh, major revision of 40 write, uh, new features in 40 view, the ability to have different row heights and list boxes. Uh, that's a really nice feature. Uh, and other list box functionality, list box-like functionality or advanced list box functionality with 4D view. Um, new features for object fields, uh, the ability to query selection by attribute. Again, very necessary and a good, good thing to have on your belt. Uh, get distinct attributes, get values corresponding to attributes. Uh, we're really seeing those object fields uh, mature and, uh, and uh, the, the capabilities with them advance. Uh, <clears throat> more functionality, nice functionality with list boxes, the ability for uh, the column to resize automatically when the list box, list box width changes, when you drag open a form per se. Uh, I know I have coded that myself in the past, and uh, with this, I wouldn't have to do that. So that's that's a I, I will appreciate that feature in particular. Um, uh, the ability to uh, execute 40 code upon resizing a, a list box column that's kind of groovy too. Um, and uh, new preferences to customize the method editor. Uh, you know, 
I, I myself spend a lot of time in the method editor, so that one's presumably for me. Thank you very much. Um, so kicking it back to uh, uh, 4D and Wakanda there, uh, hopefully uh, Ricardo has had a chance to uh, uh, um, come, come and uh, join us in the meeting. But uh, if, if not, I think Jim is ready Jim to, is ready uh, to uh, uh, present, uh, for us. present for us. Thank you, Brent. Yes, I am ready to uh, give you a little bit of Wakanda news. I'm looking out of, of our conference room, and I can see Ricardo over there uh, giving a demo uh, of Wakanda. So that's uh, he gives more demos than anyone uh, in our in our company, and he's fantastic at that. So I apologize that he can't be here now, but um, he's given me some highlights of the Wakanda news. Uh, since our last uh, 40 method meeting in in August, we released uh, Wakanda 1.1 Enterprise and Community Editions, um, and those, of course, both support Angular 2 and Ionic 2, which is a big advancement for us. And uh, in just a couple weeks, Wakanda will be the biggest sponsor of the NGConf in Europe, in Paris. So uh, this is, of course, is the conference dedicated to all things. Okay. Angular JS. It's uh, also the advancement of the latest web and mobile technology. So we're uh, pleased to be able to uh, be a huge sponsor there. We'll be sending 13 people from the Wakanda team to the conference, um, which is uh, huge for us, and it's, it, it should be a really good opportunity. And um, we will also be a big sponsor at the Salt Lake City. Oh, great. Thank you, Brent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's where we'll be in two weeks. We'll also be a uh, big sponsor of the Salt Lake City uh, NGConf, which is in April 2017. So that's just a brief rundown of the, of the news from Wakanda. Um, and again, sorry that Ricardo couldn't be here, but thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have to, uh, if anyone has any questions about, uh, about any of the Wakanda news, hopefully Ricardo will join us a little bit later and can uh, address, address them. them. But uh, it's exciting to see Wakanda uh, present at uh, these Angular conferences, and uh, and furthermore, uh, the uh, the Paris Open Source Summit. Um, so, anyways, uh, moving right along, uh, we have the 40 iNug e digest from Ed Hammond, where he reviews some of the recent topics uh, that people have been talking about on the Nug. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Uh, a few interesting. Uh, threads and messages out there on the iNug in the last uh, six weeks or so. And uh, one of them uh, started by David Adams. Go watch Thomas Mall's presentation now. It's a shameless plug for 4D Method. Um, it generated uh, quite a bit of traffic, uh, a lot of references to the, the new uh, messaging architecture, preemptive processing, and it's well worth a, a look into. Uh, all of the links uh, for the threads that I've got are on the eDigest page of the 40 Method website. So you can go there and go directly to those threads on Nabl. Uh, along that same line, uh, David also uh, posted a, a message on message-oriented architectures in 4D, some of his approaches that he's used over the years, and he's done quite a bit of work with that. And there uh, uh, was a a spin-off of those threads called Refactoring and Testing, which was go watch Thomas Mall's presentation now. Um, if you're following the, uh, the new features of V16 and the R releases, um, there's a good discussion. I'll give a plug for the 4D forums uh, for a preemptive processing discussion. It is on the beta channel, the R release and beta channel. Um, so if you've got access to those, uh, you can check out that thread. Um, there's also, uh, I've included a link to Thomas Mall's uh, presentation, which you can review uh, from our website. Um, beyond that, we have uh, Robert Broussard. It's good to see some of the people coming back to 4D that have uh, been away for a while. Uh, his question, uh, and a good thread that followed, was uh, 4D shell or not so much. In other words, uh, do I need a shell to start development? Are there other features? And uh, this led to general discussion on the merits of starting a new 4D project with a shell or not, uh, moving code between versions of 4D, and taking what works and refactoring for new features or capabilities. 
uh, a lot of good tips on creating usable code in there. Uh, Kirk Brooks had a thread uh, posting this, things I wish I'd known when I started programming. Uh, that included links to uh, some other sites that had some uh, general observations on development and some good advice. Just uh, doesn't matter what, uh, what theater you work in, uh, all good general rules. There's a continued discussion on constants versus IP variables. Uh, that was started by Keith Goebel. And um, that included some of the references to one of our previous presentations by Jim Dorrance. Uh, there's a link uh, on our page to that presentation. And uh, I just have to say the use of uh, 40, uh, constants in 4E can make your programming a, a lot more efficient and less error prone. Uh, our own city application at the Art Institute makes extensive use of constants. Uh, Brent went so far as to wrote, write a constants manager that's included in uh, the admin section of our application. Uh, but with most things in programming, there's more than one way to do it. So you can check out uh, Jim's presentation for that. And uh, with 40 pop, it's a lot easier to use constants in your code. Uh, the last uh, message I want to highlight was uh, one started by Keith White where he's asking about deployment of vertical market 4D apps in the AWS cloud. Um, a lot of good stuff on placing Nginx in front of 4D and some step-by-step -step instructions for spooling up an instance on AWS provided by uh, Bellender Walia. So uh, as always, if I butchered your name, see me at the next uh, summit and uh, I'll buy you a beer. And that's uh, the highlights from the, the digest uh, for the last six weeks. Thanks, Ed. And uh, you better watch out how many uh, how many names you're mentioning because uh, <clears throat> you might might be buying a few rounds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think I'll be buying some too myself. Um, just uh, just wanted to kick it over to uh, back to uh, Brian and, and uh, 4D, 4D at 4D. 4D. He had a, a, one more thing to add. This is the first time I've wanted a more complicated name. Maybe I get a beer out of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can cash in on that. <laughs> so we all want to get to Bruno, so I'll be quick. Um, the uh, Just have a couple quick things to mention. I, I've mentioned before, but um, we now have all the videos from the summit uh, released on KB. So if you are a summit attendee, you have access to all of those. If you're a partner, then you will soon have access to those and we'll be releasing um, uh, a schedule of what will be released um, later this year, early next year. So uh, uh, partners will, will get to see all the great um, talks about all those new features we talked about in both R5 and V16. There was a lot of uh, sessions on uh, many of those topics. Um, and uh, Oh, and uh, so last month was uh, September Fest. We uh, wanted to uh, shine a light on partners for September. Uh, if you are not a partner and you would love to get access to that V16 beta or to the uh, the coming videos when they are released for partners, then uh, this is a great time to give us a call and talk to us. And uh, we will uh, see what we can do to make sure that you can get into the partner program at the uh, this is a good time to do it. Um, even though it's the end of the year, we have uh, some some deals that make it uh, make a lot of sense right now. Uh, so please give us a call, and uh, we'll talk about that. Thank you very much, Brent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, and uh, let's see where were we? Ah, hey, four D. <clears throat> so we have the ability to set up uh, to set help tips in the interface now, which is uh, something I've I've really uh, looked for for a long time, and I'm glad that's there now in the language. Um, and we can also use styled text, which is really terrific. Um, how about if we had the ability to use styled text in our help tips? Uh, I, I would have a, an immediate use for that myself right now, and I think it, uh, I think it'd be a real, uh, real terrific feature for people's applications to be able to do that. So. Um, Hey, 4D, it'd be a lot cooler if you did. So moving right along. Uh, oh, right. 
uh, for feature requests, <clears throat> you uh, if you come up with any uh, Hey 4D things that you'd like to uh, uh, suggest, uh, you can go to uh, the forum at uh, forums.4d.fr. This link that we you see here. Um, and uh, submit the feature request directly to 4D. Um, or you can also submit it to us, and we'll put it in a, a queue for a, a Hey 4D request from 4D method. Uh, so anyways, uh, there's a nice knowledge base article on, uh, on the preferred way of submitting those requests that you can find uh, at this link here on the, uh, the 4D knowledge base. <coughs> So, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, to introduce uh, our special presenter today. Um, we have uh, Bruno Legay uh, connecting to us from Paris, France, actually not far away from where the uh, European summit was. I assume he uh, he was able just to just to walk down the street uh, a little bit closer than 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 I was for the uh, summit. So, uh, lucky him. Uh, he's fluent in French and in English, and uh, we will we'll accept uh, questions in either language as long as we get a bit of a translation, uh, for me anyways. Um, he's been working with 4D since 1992, I think uh, he's about 4D version 5. In uh, 1998, he joined ANC Consulting, a 4D-focused company working for several clients and in uh, Paris and in France and elsewhere on bespoke projects. Uh, currently, Bruno is a lead developer of their team and, and enjoys writing generic, reusable, and modular code and is fond of components, uh, which are a really great feature of 4D to be able to, to share codes, uh, to, to share your code and, and modules. Um, early on, he did work with the uh, uh, Oracle uh, plugins that. 4D offers for connecting with Oracle, uh, 4D for Oracle, and then uh, 4D for OCI. Uh, I don't envy him for that. I've also done a bit of that myself, and uh, boy, that that can get complicated. Um, he does a lot of work with uh, XML and related technologies, and is known for his weird interest in working with blobs, bits, and protocols, which has proven useful in working with HTTP, web services, security, and Unix and Linux uh, connections and uh, setups. And he's been a speaker at the European Summit, <clears throat> where I uh, met Bruno, um, since uh, 2013 in subjects like refactoring and XML and uh, cloud storage with, with S3. So um, uh, here we have our special topic, cloud-based storage with 4D and S3. Uh, and uh, I'll hand it over to you, Bruno. Hi, thank you, Brent, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, so today I will talk to you uh, about um, 4D and S3, which is a, a cloud storage system. Um, so I will um, go through the presentation I did at the summit, and um, um, I will start with, uh, so I'll start to share my screen. Uh, okay, so now you should see my screen and I will start my presentation. Okay, so I hope it's, this is okay. Um, so we're talk, going to talk about 4D and S3. My name is Bruno Legay. And um, I will start by going through um, general definition about cloud. Um, I assume you all know roughly what is uh, cloud computing, but it's quite interesting, I think, to uh, go quickly through um, some basics of the cloud. Um, I found a simple definition of cloud computing, which is the delivery of hosted services over the internet. Um, there are more complex definitions, but I think this sums up quite uh, well the, um, um, the, the cloud computing. There are a few character characteristics on the cloud computing, it's an on-demand service. It's something you can really get easy access to. It's easy to get um, resources for cloud services. It relies obviously on broad network access, and this is also um, this <coughs> also means it relies a lot on standard uh, network protocols like HTTP, for instance. 
There is a concept of resource pooling, which means the uh, service cloud service provider is going to aggregate and take many uh, resources and present them to you in one um, transparent manner. So, and there is a concept also of elasticity, the uh, idea is that you can grow your usage of the uh, service or reduce it, reduce it as your needs may evolve. And the last one is measured services, um, usually on a, a cloud offering from a, a cloud service provider, they will monitor how much resources you are using. Uh, this is useful for yourself, but it's also very useful for them because they, in the end, going to charge you for the use of the service. So that's why they're going to have a very close um, monitoring of what you use and how much. I'll go quickly through the different service models you see in the cloud. The, um, there are three main models. The first one is infrastructure, infrastructure as a service. Um, this is typically um, where you would basically hire uh, a virtual machine uh, on the cloud. Um, and we'll see an example at Amazon. There is a platform as a service. Uh, basically, the um, ser cloud service provider will provide you with a runtime and you develop your solution in this runtime, but you don't have to uh, manage the lower layers. And finally, there is um, the uh, software as a service or SaaS. Um, a good example of that, for instance, is Salesforce, which is a very popular cloud solution. If you look at these uh, different models in a stack, you will see that uh, on a traditional on-premise solution, you've got to manage all the stacks of the solution, which goes from the network, the storage, up to the application. In an infrastructure as a service, the uh, lower layers are taken care of by the uh, cloud service provider, so the network storage and so on. In the platform as a service, uh, you only have to manage the application and the data, and in an application as a service, you don't have to manage any of the, uh, um, of the infrastructure, so it's all handled and managed by the cloud service provider. Um, so then we can ask why cloud computing today? The cloud advantage, advantages are um, reliability. Um, it's the, the cloud service provider are going to offer you a very strong and reliable uh, solution with high av availability uh, aspect, which is very difficult to achieve if you manage your own infrastructure. It's difficult to achieve and it's very expensive if you want to achieve this kind of level of um, quality. Uh, scalability is something that the uh, start startups really love. It's the ability to start with a small solution and grow and pay for as much service you use uh, as at the same time as your business grows. You don't have to over invest um, into big, large architecture when you're not going to use it straight away. Um, cost is also an advantage because, as I said earlier, to provide a very high quality with high uh, avail availability service, it can be very um, costly in terms of uh, hardware and uh, also uh, um, of people being able to uh, set up all these solutions and maintaining it. And the last one is also security. They would offer you um, a high level of security, probably higher than what you can manage yourself in your own managed infrastructure. There are a few drawbacks in the cloud. Um, the cost estimation can be quite difficult because it's, it could be a, f a bit of an unknown. Uh, there are tools to help you to calculate and estimate your uh, cost. There is a risk of vendor lock-in. Um, your data won't be locked in, but uh, if you uh, focus on interfacing and using one service provider, migrating to a different cloud service provider may need some uh, sort of 
uh, adapting and rewriting for the different APIs. There's a question of ownership and uh, security. I'm talking about this in terms of when you discuss the cloud, people are always worried about uh, will my will my data be analyzed by the cloud service provider? Uh, can the um, government access my data? Um, it's all the questions around the Patriot Act and so on, which sometimes can be a problem for some people. So you've got to, um, to take this aspect into account. Now, um, it's interesting to, um, to think about how we can use the cloud with 4D. And um, we had um, a use case for that. Um, we thought about uh, this solution when we had uh, the case of a database with many large blobs in our data file. Some of them could be over 30 megabytes. Um, basically, it's documents with metadata uh, that we are storing in blobs. The blob creation rate is low, so we're not creating lots of blobs every day. It's you know, a regular um, linear creation rate. The blobs are rarely modified and the um, number of blobs we are reading is low. So we are mostly using blobs to kind of archive uh, data. The problem we are faced when we have this kind of situation is that we've got a large uh, percentage of blobs in our data. Our data file is mostly made of blobs. Um, then you end up having managing large data files and that can be sometimes difficult when you've got data files which are, we're talking here about more than 100 gigabytes of, um, of data. So when you've got to manage this kind of data file, it can be a bit uh, um, not very agile. It takes time, it's difficult to back up, you need a lot of storage and so on. And what we would have liked ideally is to have some sort of di differential backups for these blobs, but for the structured data, we really liked the full um, backup. The integrity is interesting in the full, in the relational uh, database, the integrity is very good with a, a full backup. So we compared a bit what were our options and what were the advantages and the uh, different criteria we needed to have a look at. Um, so there was some um, some different options of storing the data in the blob, which could be in a record, in a data file or on disk. So most of this is managed by um, 4D. So this is quite transparent. Then there is the option of um, storing your, um, your blobs in a local disk. Um, and basically, you would, for instance, use a method executed on the server to fetch the data and um, re send it back to the client. That could be some an option. You could also use, uh, I've seen this kind of architecture, use a, a file sharing protocol like FTP or WebDAV to share the resources over the network. Or the last solution we looked at was uh, storing the data on the cloud. So this is the um, um, general stuff. We're going to go now more into the details of the implementation. And at the end, we will look at some, um, some code sample. So we took an approach of saying everything is an object. So a file is an object. A blob is an object. Um, but for REST, when we talk in the REST um, terms, an object is a resource. So uh, the terminology is not always um, helping us here. So you've got to keep the different terms. They sometimes mean the same thing. So we decided to uh, create cloud objects um, and we decided to identify it with a UID to have a unique identifier. We wanted to st store locally in our uh, record metadata we wanted to have a thumbnail. We didn't want to access the network or the cloud to um, get a thumbnail of the file or picture, for instance. And we ended up in a little basic um, record structure, which looked like this. Um, 
The resource metadata could be anything from a file name, a creation modification date, um, a type, so it could be a PDF, JPEG, ping, XML or whatever. We could have also a size or a checksum. And for instance, for PDF, we could have a number of pages. And for images, we can store things like resolution, EXIF, and so on. So for that, the uh, C object is a very good way of storing all these things because it's very flexible. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, Amazon AWS. Um, so this is the solution I looked at uh, for implementing cloud storage. Um, so what we can say about Amazon is that they are visionary on the market. They started to uh, offer services over the internet from 2006. They are a leader in terms of market share and um, the number of services they offer. Uh, there is the eat your own dog food approach to their um, uh, products, which means that the Amazon online web uh, store that you probably all know and use is in fact uh, relying on the services uh, which are in the Amazon um, catalog. So they, oh, they use their own uh, services to build their uh, online store. And they've got also, which is a very important uh, aspect of this uh, project, is they've got a very good documentation. Just checking if uh, everything is okay for you guys. Yes, okay. All right, um, so we've been through that, sorry. I'll talk about the few services, some of the most popular services they have. Uh, the first one is S3, which stands for Simple Storage Service. This is an object storage service, so you will, it's basically kind of a, a key store storage system. Um, the second storage service is EBS, which is Elastic um, uh, Block Storage. Uh, this is different from S3 in, in the way that if you, for instance, uh, require a 20 gigabyte of data on EBS, you will pay for 20 gig gigabyte of data, even if on this amount of data you've required, you didn't put any files. Um, it will allow you, for instance, to have like a partition you can mount on your disk, and but the the um, problem is that you will also pay for the space uh, the space which is not used. Um, whereas with S3, you will only pay for the amount of data you are storing. So if you are storing, for instance, a one kilobyte uh, file, you're going only to pay for one kilobyte. Uh, there is the uh, EC2, which is uh, Elastic Cloud Computing, which is basically virtual machines. There is Glacier, Glacier in French, for archiving. Uh, this is similar to S3, except that, uh, that it's more, mostly designed for cold storage. Um, it's, it's an idea that, the idea is that you would store the data um, and you can retrieve it, but there may be a delay of a few hours before you retrieve your data. So this is mostly for storing data you won't need in most scenarios, in most case. Uh, for instance, for legal things that you may not need, but uh, you may need to present them back if somebody asks them for uh, these documents or files. There is a DynamoDB. It's a NoSQL database written by Amazon. There is Beanstalk, which is an app deployment service uh, running languages like Ruby, Python, Java, and so on. Uh, there is RDS, which is a managed database service. Um, this runs various flavors of uh, relational database like Oracle, uh, SQL Server, MySQL, and so on. And you just have to uh, create an instance of your database and uh, Amazon takes care of all the um, backups and so on. And there is many, many, many more services offered by um, uh, Amazon. So this is just uh, some of the most popular ones. 
So the first thing you've got to do with uh, to use AWS is to create an account. Um, this will allow you to access the AWS console and to manage your services and to get credentials to get uh, access to those services. I will just show you quickly what it looks like. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, this is the uh, AWS console. Uh, so, if you go to the um, home page of the AWS console, you can see here that I am uh, connected and you can see the different services here and uh, you can look, have a look at the um, S3 console, hopefully. Right, and we, we're going to talk about a bit more about what it, um, what this is all the buckets and so on a bit later. But basically you can use the cloud through this interface for uh, management. Uh, so once you've created your account, you can access all this information. <clears throat> so create the account to get access to the console and get your credentials. The credentials are made of two, um, two fields, two uh, information. The access key ID, which is 20 chars, and a secret access key, which is 20 chars. These are provided to you by the AWS uh, console tool. The other uh, aspect of AWS to understand is the concept of regions. Um, we're going to have 11 regions currently uh, in the world. Uh, you've got to check the availability of the service you have required or you want to use in the given region. And you've got usually to select the region close to you so the uh, delivery time is faster. But also you can have a look at um, uh, cost because the cost may vary across region. So this is the list of uh, the regions um, we have. The new one is uh, AP South which is in Mumbai which has been open in uh, June uh, but they are um, spread across the world more or less and on the map it looks like this. Um, so I'm not sure you can see my, um, my pointer of my mouse but uh, you can see some uh, green uh, region, the circles, they are new planned region and I'm glad to tell you that there will be a new region coming soon in uh, France. Um, the orange regions are um, live regions, some are a bit special like the Chinese and there is the government cloud which are restricted, um, they're not available for the general public. And you can see a number within this circle. It's the what the Amazon calls an availab availability zone. Uh, and this number is always greater than one because basically in a given region, Amazon does duplicate a data center um, completely, including the internet access and the electricity uh, um, service so that if there is a one problem in one of the data center the other data center in the same region can actually take over and recover from the failure which may be encountered in one of the uh, availability zone. So this gives you a, a sense of uh, redundancy um, which is very good. Or, um, so. So when you talk about uh, AWS, there is um, uh, concepts which are important to understand. Um, the first one is the endpoint. The endpoint is the host domain part of the URL. And for instance, this uh, endpoint is the S3 service endpoint in the uh, EU Frankfurt region. EU Central 1 is for Frankfurt and you will be able to access uh, this S3 service in Frankfurt through this URL. Now in terms of tools and APIs provided by uh, Amazon to access their um, uh, services, there is the um, online management console which we looked at. Um, this is a traditional 
web interface, but uh, it's not always very um, um, uh, flexible to use. There is a, a CLI, a command line interface to, um, to use. Um, we'll talk a bit more about it a bit later. And there are various uh, SDKs provided by Amazon uh, in the Java language, PHP, Python, Ruby, and so on. And there is also, very important, um, some APIs. Um, they are mostly RESTful APIs. They used to have uh, SOAP APIs, but these are large, largely deprecated now. So I wouldn't recommend trying to use those if they are, even if they are still working. Um, so we can look now at the AWS command line tool. So how does it work? Uh, first, what you need to know, is this is a Python-based tool. Uh, so this is a cross-platform solution. It works on uh, Linux, uh, Windows, OS X, and all sorts of machine. Uh, for instance, I got it to run on a Raspberry Pi, which is a tiny microcomputer running an uh, ARM uh, architecture. Uh, so you can run an, um, the uh, AWS CLI on these kind of machines. Uh, it's a unified tool for all services, so you will use that to manage your uh, S3 resources, but you, or you could also use it to manage your EC2 instances and so on. It's a cross-platform, as I said, because it's based on Python. You need a Python runtime, of course. Uh, and you can use it with 4D uh, using launch external process. So this is a classic um, use of launch external process. Um, so to first thing you need to do is to download and install it. Um, this is the instruction on the um, Amazon website are very clear about this. It's not very complicated. Um, then the first command you need to use is AWS configure, where you would provide your um, AWS access key, your secret key, and provide a default default region name. And uh, AWS CLI tool will store this information secretly somewhere on your disk and reuse it later when you uh, call or use the command line. So you only have to do it once, you don't have to do it for every call or every command. Um, the syntax and arguments are service specific. Um, for instance, it will look something like this. So AWS, the name of the service, and then the specific syntax. The output can be JSON, text, tab, or table form. And they've got a great documentation, and there is also an online documentation. Um, I can try to give you a little demo about um, uh, AWS CLI, if you want. So. Okay, uh, talk, talk, talk. so I hope you can see my terminal here. Um, so basically, AWS uh, will do S3, we'll do LS, hopefully, and this give, give you some sort of results. So this is basically the kind of thing you can do. Um, I've prepared some of the commands earlier. I'll see what uh, we can... Um, uh, sample code, no. Uh, install notes, I think it was in install notes. Um, so for instance, you can use a command called sync, which is very good for syncing a full, um, full um, hierarchy, for instance. So it's um, AWS. AWS S3, and you'd use the uh, subcommand, which is called sync, and then you provide some sort of URL for your resource, and you would say where you want to copy your data, and I've used the um, argument dry run just to simulate what it will do. So it doesn't work, of course. <laughs> um, let's try again. Okay. So it's downloading some sort of data locally to my machine. So this is the kind of commands you can use with AWS. 
Um, the constraint of using AWS are that you need to install the software um, and therefore you need it can be a bit problem problematic to deploy this kind of solution. Um, so we talked about that. Okay. Now I think the most interesting part in AWS is the APIs they offer. They are, as I said, REST-based. Um, they use a common authentication mechanism, um, and all this authentication part can be quite complicated, but it's taken care of in the component we're going to have a look at. And they are uh, service-specific APIs. So let's look more specifically about Amazon at Amazon S3. Uh, first part is the cost of S3, just to have a look. Uh, for one gigabyte, it will cost you around three cents of a dollar per month. Um, and the cost may vary depending on the region. Um, I think this is very interesting kind of price for this kind of services. Um, so this is a, a very interesting um, approach. There is a, a page uh, to help you to calculate the uh, cost of your uh, solution. So basically you will enter all kind of criterias and parameters and the um, system, this page, will calculate uh, how much it will cost you per month if you uh, choose their solution. So uh, this is a good way to estimate your cost. Um, we're going to talk about the different concepts and resources um, on S3. There is two main concepts. The first one is a bucket. Um, the bucket is what you can imagine as a root container. This is the um, most basic place where you would store your data. You always store your data inside a bucket. And the second part is the object. And an object is identified by a key. And this may be a bit surprising, but these are all key examples. The first one is a key. The second one here is a key. And this is also a key. It looks like uh, some kind of folder hierarchy, but the whole path is actually a key for the object. So this is sometimes a bit confusing, but uh, you've got to really take into account that uh, the uh, full path or the full key is the, um, the key which identifies your object. So this is sometimes a bit um, uh, disturbing, but uh, you've got to get used to it. Um, on top of the um, of this basic uh, concept, you've got uh, properties on the object. Um, you've got uh, basic properties like key, as I said, the size, uh, various dates, and so on. You can have, which is quite unusual, an expiry date, which means you can create an object and uh, predict when this object will uh, self-destruct. You can have can get different uh, level of storage. Um, you can get standard storage or reduced redundancy storage. This will have an impact on the cost. So if your data is not that important, uh, you can use reduced redundancy. There are therefore more risk of maybe losing data, um, but by default it's standard uh, storage. Um, you can decide to encrypt the data uh, and have Amazon to encrypt the data for you, or you can decide not to encrypt the data. Uh, for instance, if you decide to encrypt your data on the client side before sending it, there is no point of getting the server to encrypt the data again. So um, this is where you can um, choose to um, um, optimize your storage by choosing no server-side encryption. You can manage several types of permissions, like public or restricted to uh, uh, different um, uh, people. And you can store all sorts of metadata, like uh, uh, MIME type and so on. So let's look at an S3 URL, how it will look like. There is two possible syntax. Um, the first one is to use the bucket name 
um, in the um, endpoint. So you could start the URL with the bucket name dot s3 dot the uh, region and then the Amazon AWS.com or you could put the bucket name after the slash at uh, the beginning of the URI. So this is two different syntax possible for accessing your bucket. So a URL with a key will look something like this. So you can see it's very uh, simple. You will use your basic uh, here, basic URL, and you would add the object key. Uh, the ob key could look something like this, and you could also use that with a query string. So for instance, this kind of URL, URL is going to request the ACL, so access control list, on this object in this bucket on S3 in this region. Um, so we talked earlier on about AWS CLI. There are two kind of services for S3. Uh, the first one is AWS S3, which allows you to uh, uh, interact with your um, S3 objects, but there is also a second API, which is called S3 API, which allows you to uh, set different kind of properties and it's got different kind of, uh, of arguments. We can have a look quickly at how, how they look like and we can have a look at the uh, online help as well. So as you could see here earlier, I used AWS S3 and if you want some Info. I think it's just that help, and you can get. Bruno, is, yes. it, po is it possible to uh, to increase the font size on the uh, terminal? Right, like that. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Better. Perfect. Okay, so as I said, um, if you want help on the commands, you can use uh, help, and you will get a standard help um, to get all the kind of arguments you can use. And if you want S3 API, you will see uh, the different commands you can use um, in this um, different kind of, uh, of service. So here, for instance, if we look um, with S3 API, you can uh, create a bucket, delete a bucket, um, delete objects, and so on. Whereas the other one, the S3 will give you more um, command, which will look like a terminal, like uh, copy, move, and sync, and stuff like that, and list. Yeah, you can see the uh, the different commands, CP, MV, and RM, which are standard Unix command. So they are kind of mimicking the Unix command within their syntax. So this is what you're going to use if you want to use the uh, CLI and probably with 4D you would use launch external process. Okay. Um, the most interesting part of um, AWS and S3 for me, for my own um, opinion, is the REST uh, API. Um, and where you can do operations on buckets, operation on objects, and the S3 response format is sometimes XML, sometimes JSON. It's not very consistent. You just have to look at the documentation and uh, be prepared to be able to handle both formats. The documentation is really, really well done. I uh, really recommend you um, to have a look at it. It's really, really um, detailed, precise, lot of example, very clear. Uh, I talked earlier about the authentication and signature. Uh, this is the, um, I said, the, the complicated part, but uh, if you use the component I wrote, uh, this will be transparent for you, so don't worry. There is two possible ways of uh, authenticating and signing your, um, your request. Uh, you can use authentication through HTTP headers or you could use a query string parameters. Uh, so query string is basically what you will see in the URL after a, a 
uh, question mark and um, different uh, string you will find after that. Um, again, the documentation is very well done, so have a look at that. Um, just quickly, I'm going to talk about the signature. So the signature is a combination of uh, HMAC SHA-256. Uh, it does combine things like your secret access key, the region, the date, and so on. And it creates a signature. And then again, the signature is combined with a canon canonical request, which is uh, combining all this information with um, the um, context of your request, like a, a hash payload. So the data you're sending, for instance, is going to be signed and combined all into this signature. So all this looks complicated, but this is taken care of by the component. Um, so the AWS component, uh, which I'm going to talk about, um, contains a CLI helper. So the idea is to uh, simplify the call to the um, to the command line interface. So the f if you can use that, but you don't have to use it. You can use only and just the uh, REST APIs. But if you want to use the CLI, um, you can use that to help you. So the first thing you will have to do is to um, tell the uh, component where your uh, AWS CLI uh, binary are installed. And then you can use um, the command here, AWS CLI, sorry, X. AWS CLI run, and you will give the uh, instruction and the command, and it will provide you or return to you the results in uh, a text variable. Uh, this Boolean here is to say if you want to run the um, the command in a synchronous form or asynchronous. This is basically a wrapper on the launch external process. It's nothing very uh, complicated or clever on it, but it could be just a bit useful. Um, this is another example. This command will return the um, properties of an object, and we will get these properties into a text, which is JSON, which you can pass to load into an object. Um, and I also wrote the component so you can directly pass an object to the uh, to the command CLI run, and it will detect if it's JSON and then load directly the uh, data into the object. So this kind of command here is going to uh, um, instantiate your C object with the data we can see below as, um, as um, comments. Uh, this is another example where you would get the result of this uh, image. So basically, I'm asking S3 to copy the content of this uh, ping image. And the iPhone used at the end, I'm not sure if you can see my uh, pointer, at the end of the string means that to send it back to the standard output, which means I will get the results into the blob. So this will basically copy the picture into my blob. Uh, this is another trick. And the most interesting part, as I said, is for me, the uh, REST API. So um, to manage the REST API, I got um, inspired by the way the CLI works and in the way it manages credentials. Um, I wanted to avoid to have to provide all the time the credentials. So I've... Um, allowed the um, developer to kind of set the parameters um, into variables managed by the component, and then they are reused in the subsequent uh, calls. Um, they can be stored like this in um, hard-coded in your method, or it can be also stored into uh, a preference file, which is um, stored locally in your machine, and um, the um, secret access key is encrypted. So this is an example. This is not real uh, access key or secret key, of course. This is just samples. Uh, but it's just to show you how to uh, kind of parameter and set your, um, your secret information. Uh, 
And after you've done that, you can call the um, uh, REST uh, S3 REST API uh, with this kind of commands. So I will try to spend a bit of time to explain to you how it works. Um, the S3 REST API basically is a wrapper on HTTP uh, method, HTTP client, so it would be a GET, PUT, or whatever. So here we're going to do an HTTP GET method, so uh, the GET verb in HTTP uh, language. Uh, we're going to use a bucket which is called AC Consulting Test, and the URI is just slash. And when you do that, you will get basically the content of your um, of your bucket, the list of objects in your bucket. Um, so and we're going to have a look at the demo later, and we can look more into the code. But uh, this is just so you kind of get familiar with the uh, the syntax demonstration. Right. I'm serious now. So I wrote the component in a 4D v14, and it's currently used in this demo in 4D v15. So I'm launching the demo and pray. Um, so the first uh, part of the demo is a little screen I made to uh, show the list of buckets for my account. And this list is actually made of data which is retrieved from the cloud. Um, we can have a look and if we can trace that. And we're going to... Uh, So I wrote this little method called AWS S3 bucket list get. And we can trace here and see what happens. So we get into the um, breakpoint here and we will see the um, verb, which is get. The bucket name. There's no bucket because I want to the uh, the list of all the buckets and the URI which is slash. So we'll see what happens. So I get a response blob, which is uh, XML. So I'll check the um, response status, which is 200, which is good, and we can have a look at the uh, content of the uh, response. Hopefully, okay. so this is the content of the resp response. It's not very readable, so I'll make it a bit more readable by indenting it. And this is already a bit more readable. So you can see the list of all your buckets um, in the message. So now we just have to pass these results and um, update our um, list box to um, to display this information. So I wrote a little method here called AWS S3 bucket list response pass, which basically is quite simple. We can have a look. I'm growing that so you can. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to uh, hide the um, things here. Look. So this is just doing a DOM pass um, for the results. Search for the bucket element and loop through uh, these elements and fill arrays of data. That's all it does. Okay. And that this allows me to display the list of buckets. So this is the general idea of the uh, of uh, working with S S3 um, REST APIs. Uh, another one I created, for instance, is to um, a call to create a new bucket. So we're going to create a bucket. Uh, one thing about buckets, which I forgot to mention, is that the bucket name needs to be unique across all users in one region because it's used in a URL and of course it needs to be unique. So for that I 
prefix all my buckets with uh, AC consulting. And I will call 40 method. So I will create, send a message to create a bucket. So just go over that. And you can see that the bucket has been created here. And to show you that I'm not cheating, if we if I go here, uh, AWS, uh, I'll go to S3. Hopefully, I can see this bucket, which is currently empty. So this this is the bucket I created, and you could see here, hopefully with lifecycle, the creation date, which is uh, roughly. Uh, now, so because I've just created it. Okay. Go back to the demo. So this way you can list your buckets, create new buckets. Um, I've made a second screen where I can uh, have a look at my the content of my buckets. So I'll take this one off. Okay, so you could choose different uh, buckets. Um, so for instance, this all seem to be empty. So what I've done on this screen is I've implemented uh, a drag and drop features to be able to drop files directly onto a bucket. So if I go, for instance, in uh, this, get a few files like this one and this one, for instance, and drop these files um, into my bucket, I've created a a process which will send each of these files one by one to the bucket. So we can see these files. If I go back to my console here, upload, and I can see the files I've sent there. If I want to retrieve this file or view this file, I can just view it like this. Right? Or I can open it, for instance, in a browser, like this. Okay. So, uh, the, the horror. Yeah, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> what a waste. Um, so this is an example of things you can do with um, S3. Um, what else can I show you? So of course you can delete some of these objects. So this is all code I've created around uh, a list box, but uh, the basic APIs are always the same. If you look at um, the code. So this is the bucket content. Um, method option. So, for instance, this process sends the data, and what it will do is um, somehow. Sorry, I'm trying to find where it does the uh, view in browser delete. Uh, no, it's the drop. Um, searching for the drop. Um, Uh -huh. Unclicked, it's not that. On drop, I've created a method called drop handler. It gets all the file paths which needs to be uploaded and then creates an upload file process. Uh, so, choke. Yeah. Which is upload file, okay. And basically, it used the same command again and again to send the file. So it's always the same command, which is a wrapper on HTTP GET, which will be used to send the file. So here, the um, file is sent to a blob. 
document to blob and we will send the blob to S3. Going back to the demo. And the other thing I can show you is that um, we talked earlier about uh, what we call the cloud object, which is basically having um, uh, a table to store your uh, reference to your cloud object. So I'll show you the uh, structure as I showed you earlier. So what we will see now on the screen is basically uh, a list box of this table, but this table is related or linked to uh, an object which is stored in S3. So cloud objects, I can choose my um, 4D method, for instance, um, for the method bucket, and I will take a list of all these files, which I will going to send onto the bucket, but I'm going to create records locally in my data file with a thumbnail and uh, all, each of these files here you can see or each of these records is pointing to data stored on S3. So we can see here the information about the object, we can see the size which are stored into the C object, the original file name and so on. And we can have a look at for instance um, this object. So when I click on this basically I ask 4D to open this file which is not stored locally but stored on uh, AWS on S3 or um, something like this in a browser. So that's a classic. Here you go. So this video is not stored in your 4D data file, but it's stored on the cloud. And you can kind of integrate that and to make it quite transparent um, to the user. And the user may think it's actually stored in your database, but it's not. Um, and Another one which I created, and another example of something which can be used, is uh, in this I combined um, a little component which takes a screenshot of your screen and publishes it straight away to the internet and gives you um, a URL to access this uh, screenshot. This can be used, for instance, when one of your customer or user has got a problem with a, with a screen. You can give him a button where he can click the button will take a screenshot of the screen, send it, store it on S3, and send you the URL of that uh, resources of that image, and you can receive that information, this URL, through an email, for instance. So let's have a look at that. So let's do it with that. Up. <coughs> so publish screenshot. And here you can see the um, picture which was taken in the screenshot being opened in the uh, in my browser. So this URL allows me to take to view the screenshot my user has taken, for instance. This is just an example. But there is many many other things that uh, users can do and developers can do with uh, with uh, getting to know um, S3. This is just an example. Um, so I think that's it for me. Um, not sure if there is any question. If everything was clear. Thanks, Bruno. Let me uh, let me just check here. Uh, there was one question uh, from Bob Miller about why is it called S three? Does that stand for something? Or, yes. Course, sorry, uh, yeah. it's a, a simple storage service. Right. Yes. Um, and uh, Tim Nevels has a question. I that was an easy one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> setting up, setting you up with the softballs first. <laughs> yes. Good. Uh, hello, Bruno. Uh, question hello. Is uh, can you in the um, Explorer in 4D show us a list of all the methods that your component provides? Okay. Um, okay. Let's have a look. 
Explorer. Uh, command. Trying to find where it is. <laughs> Sorry, plugin method. Oh, look, look in method. Here we go. Um, the most useful one you would use, I think, is S3 REST API. And it's got some comments. Um, and with this one, it's kind of uh, like HTTP GET and HTTP client. You can do anything. At the, um, the work you've got to do before that and after that is to format the um, request, what the data you're going to send, and to uh, pass the result that uh, S3 is sending you. So in this demo here, we I'm using the component, which is AWS component. But in the demo, I created um, method, which are not in the component, but to either pass or um, or s prepare the message. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Uh, and, and that I think I can already almost answer my second question, which is I notice in your methods yeah. at the top of the methods you have some comments that have the at symbol at the beginning of them. Oh, yeah, that's my own. Um, and then I saw some document uh, documentation created somewhere. Is that how you created the documentation for these methods? Yeah, that's my own um, automated documentation system. Uh, that's my, I've, I've put um, tags in my comments. Um, this is just my own stuff. But uh, it helps me to create, for instance, documentation like this. Um, which is glorious. Yeah. Which, is yeah. which is fantastic. I've written several components, and this is the part I hate the most, which is when it's done, <laughs> going in and filling in all these stupid comments for every method. Yeah. And, and, and so I can see how you could automate this now with the, uh, this could be fully automated, couldn't it? Yes, it is. It is automated. So um, in, in, from version 14 and the most recent version, when I just modify my um, source code. When I save the method, the uh, comment is automatically updated. Ah, so you have it doing it dynamically as you're doing it. Oh, this is a fantastic idea. I, right. I thought about doing it in a batch mode, but this is an even better idea. Just have yeah. an update every time you save the method. Fantastic. For, for the next demo. Yeah, maybe for the <laughs> next demo. <laughs> we have a, uh, another question from Bob Miller. Um, have you found response times to store and retrieve objects to be pretty good? Uh, what would you expect for a 100 megabyte object uh, to store or retrieve to local disk? Um, yeah. Uh, good question. Um, the things you've got to look at is, of course, your own um, local bandwidth. Um, you will always be limited by that. Um, and then I. I didn't have, I didn't find much limitation, but I didn't really practice enough to uh, see a problem. Most of the time, I think I've been uh, limited by my own local bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, I know also that um, Amazon do provide lots of solutions f for things like CDN, uh, CDN's Content Delivery Network, uh, things like similar to what Akamai does to be able to provide data much more efficiently to the uh, customers. Uh, so that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that, for instance, if you are located in um, um, the West Coast, you would have to probably uh, try to use a region which is in the West Coast and uh, stuff like that. So uh, right. I don't have really data to show you, but you can you can play with it. You can try and uh, see if the, um, the uh, bandwidth is enough for you. Um, the os other aspect of this question, um, I mean, we can have a look. We, we did this test earlier, um, I think, um, where I think I downloaded some files um, from the bucket. So this is here. Oh, I can see my the shortcut or the uh, bucket. And I've copied the files locally. Um, so they've 
they've all been copied before so it doesn't really uh, mean anything but I will create a new um, directory and we'll go and try the same command again so you can see here I've downloaded um, what six seven files let's have a look um, and this is the files I've downloaded and um, so they are not really that big um, but uh, this is an example maybe somebody like uh, Keith which is also maybe with us can answer um, in terms of uh, performance um, but there's something else I can show you as well while we're here which is not totally related but um, could be an interesting part uh, with S3 you could also use S3 which is quite surprising as a kind of static website hosting here I've got an example of um, these files I'll show you these files these files which is basically an HTML file it's got a data file which is XML and a picture and few JavaScript um, libraries and you can use these files and access these files which are made public as a kind of very kind of basic dynamic website um, so this is a very a new well this is not something you would expect um, to use for s3 but it totally works and it's totally officially supported by Amazon and it's a very cheap way to uh, run and set up quickly a website That's it doesn't great. have any PHP server side uh, thing it's just the data sent just as it uh, they are but the um, the work is done on the client side on the browser so this is just an example cool um, we have a question from reddit from uh, from Justin will uh, does the component use any plugins and I, I <laughs> I suppose yes. that's um, uh, you know besides the fact that the CLI commands require uh, some setup. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked for it. Uh, no, it doesn't use any components or whatever. It doesn't even use any PHP. Um, I wrote all the um, um, basic stuff with pure 4D language. Uh, so this is the uh, component source code, which you can get as well um, but um, things like um, comments like uh, SHA-256 are implemented in pure 4D so um, it doesn't have any dependency on external tools or PHP libraries or plugins or whatever it's pure 4D code all great. written in 4D great um, so setting up the uh, the external libraries to run with a launch external process wouldn't uh, be uh, necessary if you only intend to use the rest based commands right yeah exactly that's right that's the uh, that's the idea i think most people would use the uh, rest apis and won't bother to uh, to try to deploy the uh, aws cli tool provided by amazon right but that's that's really great that you show uh, you know and you've wrapped the you know the commands for using the command line tool uh, that that makes it very flexible. <clears throat> yeah, this is a little bonus, but it's uh, uh, I think the most interesting part is the uh, REST API, which is really fascinating and really interesting. Right. Uh, we have a question from Keith White uh, about MIME types, and I'll let him take over from here. Yep. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Bruno. It's Keith. Hi. Hi, Keith. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, thank you. Um, I just need to say that Keith has been uh, one of my beta tester for this component. So uh, uh, thank you, Keith, for uh, debugging out the uh, the code. Yeah, well, there wasn't many bugs. So I don't re I don't remember any. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah. So mime types. I was wondering about that um, versus file extensions. Um, I saw something in your code about that. I've not dealt with it much. I've just used file extensions for the most part. But just could you could you just uh, say a bit about uh, about the mapping between the, those two things? Right. Uh, I've done something in the uh, demo 
about MIME types, and I've created a m function to convert uh, an extension. So, uh, for instance, try to have a look at that. An extension like uh, .png into a MIME type, and what I use for that is uh, a. I'll try to uh, get into <coughs> the. I use a resources. I'll show you. I use a. Re I told you I like XML, but uh, so I created XML uh, file, which is a extension MIME lookup, where I basically configure the extension and the related MIME type. So this is just a, a file which I use and can help me to uh, to convert uh, an extension to uh, the, the equivalent MIME type. And in the demo, I use that to uh, guess the MIME extension from the, um, sorry, the MIME type from the extension. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, um, Presumably, if you, when you when you're putting these files into um, uh, AWS S3, you, it's a good idea to to tell it the MIME type so that that it can. Uh, it's, it's not that you you need to. It's just if you're going to use it for any other purpose, then Amazon knows about what MIME type it is. So if a browser comes across it, then it can. Yes, that really helps. That really helps the uh, browser to understand what kind of content it's going to get and to uh, to be able to display it correctly. So if it's a, a video, it's going to show you the controls for a video. If it's an XML, it may di display it properly, uh, and so on. Does that? So I can show you here the uh, AWS S3 upload file method. Um, I use here, as you see, the uh, the function to convert the extension to a MIME type. Right, yeah. Yeah, so this information is sent, um, I'm trying to remember, is sent as a final last optional parameter. So this is uh, something you can use. Uh, okay, thanks. I was just, just asking that because uh, one, of the, one of the use cases that we, we use is, is to put um, something that I don't think you, you actually covered it yet, but there's a, there's a method called query URL. Um, yes, which, which is what 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 we've used that for is in in displaying a web interface for for Synergist. Um, we we're including these URLs which allow users to both upload and download stuff, and the really cool part about that is that the browser uploads and downloads straight to S3 without go, the blob, without the file or the blob going anywhere near 4D. So that is very cool because that means we can just offload all of that bandwidth and all of those issues uh, about transporting the, the large file around so the browser user can go s straight to S3 and back without, without having to worry using that qu query URL method that you wrote. And I think that's probably one of the coolest parts. Wow. Yes, I, I can show you the the call to this uh, method, um, the one that Keith is talking about. Um, as you said, you can access the uh, the resources, the uh, objects on S3 using the uh, uh, query URL, basically the information which is after the question mark. And these methods allow you to generate this um, URL. So you put the these parameters inside the um, to this function and it will return to you um, uh, a URL which you can pass then to a mail or send to a mail or whatever decide what you want to do and um, this URL will be allow will allow to access this object so this is uh, also something you can use oh. that's uh, that's very flexible Seems, yes uh... yes but so the uh, you know the uh, the clever part has been done really by Amazon. You know, they are really really clever with uh, what they've done with their APIs. It's uh, it's really fantastic. Um, we have another question from Bob Miller uh, about where the component can uh, can be obtained. Uh, I think I will distribute it uh, like that. Uh, I will we'll see we'll talk about it later. Um, Brent House, where I can upload the uh, component, and uh, uh, okay. I 
you know, it's, it was distributed freely with the source code, I think, at the summit. So uh, it's a uh, it's kind of free, free component. It's a freebie. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wherever uh, wherever we can get our hands on it. Yeah, I, sh I should try to actually uh, publish a URL on S3 where the component is stored. So store right. the uh, S3 component on S3 would be right. quite, quite eating, clever stuff. Eating eating the dog food they ate. The exactly. Dog food. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> It's turning into a S3 inception here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess uh, wait for a couple more uh, comments to trickle in if anybody has anything else. But I mean, it's clearly a great option for anyone looking to introduce uh, document management into their application or uh, you know, uh, some, some way to do, have that functionality. Uh, it uh, looks, looks very strong because, uh, <clears throat> as we all know, Especially dealing with larger uh, file sizes, things start to get tricky and uh, certainly can start to uh, have an effect on uh, 4D server performance. So if you can offload that that uh, performance issue, that, that exactly that, yeah, um, and and it has a, a compiling or a magnifying effect on any kind of maintenance that you would do, uh, and uh, you know migrating your systems in 4D or uh, uh, checking your data file, all of that, uh, you know, when you're storing large, uh, even external uh, files as blobs, uh, you know, it just it still has an impact. So, um, of yeah. course, of course, that's uh, that sort of checking is now uh, uh, you know, our responsibility if it's stored on Amazon. But uh, at least we have nice options. <clears throat> Um, That's right. Sure. There's another uh, question. Um, I was just going to pipe up with a quick one, um, Brent. Mm -hmm. um, Bruno, you, you were talking about how the key path is not a um, like a directory structure, but um, yeah. Yeah. in all the examples, I, I can't say I fully understood what the difference would be. Um, okay. okay. One, 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 part one part which is, which is confusing. confusing. Here, when you look at your buckets, when you navigate through your buckets, Amazon present the information as if you were moving through um, folders. But you've got to keep in mind this is just um, a sugar part that they've made so people can be familiar with something they know, which is navigating. But if you look at, for instance, I think, this object, Hopefully, uh, the key of this object is not just map SVG data, it's, um, it's the whole path. Um, so the key is map slash data slash map SVG data. And when you use that, when you pass the details, I'm not sure we can see that um, in the console because it hides that quite well um, but when you use the API you will never use just what looks like a file name you will use the whole path as a key and you could actually have a key without having an enclosing folder does it make sense what I'm trying to explain I think so I think I'm gonna have to use it to really get it yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the um, they try to make it simple for us or make it familiar by presenting um, a folder structure in the console, but it's actually quite misleading. The real key is the full, um, the full path. Right. So it's actually being stored in a flat manner, but, uh, but the, key, it, the key itself can mimic a folder structure. If you think about it, it's kind of a, a large key value store where the uh, value are blobs or object or resources, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really make a difference. But it's a key value store. Right. And uh, HTTP is quite well. HTTP is a very flexible and uh, versatile protocol. It works well to kind of access and put and store um, objects or resources uh, using the uh, the protocol. So. It, it works very well. One thing also about large files, if you want to use very, very large files with um, uh, the component, I would recommend to look into splitting the file into um, byte ranges. It's possible for an HTTP request to send only part of an object. Uh, it's a standard 
um, HTTP part of the protocol, which is called byte range, I think. And you could say, basically, uh, I'm sending this uh, file into chunks, and you would make one call to send the first, for example, first two megabytes of the file, then a second call to send two following megabytes of the file, and this way you would have many uh, HTTP calls, not just one, to send very, very large, potentially unlimited um, files. Right. So basically, you, you send the file in chunks. And that would uh, help with any uh, potential timeout issues or uh, uh, exactly issues with keeping up a, um, a dedicated connection or uh, upload connection, um, which those are real world issues. Yes, and you could probably even create uh, parallel processes if you've got just one big file, and mm -hmm. you may have, for instance, have parallel processes trying to send the file in different different uh, processes to optimize everything. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, real real world uh, issues, I'd be very interested to hear uh, other people's uh, ideas for use cases of uh, of this component and, and uh, sharing data on S3 with 4D. Um, I can think of our own here at the museum with document store and uh, very high res uh, images and, and videos and whatnot that can become uh, cumbersome to uh, serve yourself. Um, but yeah, I'd be very interested to see uh, what other people had in mind uh, or you know, what sort of uh, thoughts that this is uh, uh, kicked off for, for uh, other developers. Um, Tim Nevels has a question. Is sending files to AWS in pieces implemented in your component? No, I haven't done it. That's a good question. I haven't done it. I've thought about doing it, but I didn't take time to do it. I, um, maybe it's just... Um, possible very easily in uh, using the basic calls I have done, um, but I haven't looked at it, to be honest. So um, you need extra HTTP headers, which are called byte range, I think. If you look at uh, HTTP header, that's called um, range, I think. And um, uh, you, you should find the documentation on HTTP. Um, so something like that range, you would say the bytes, and you would say from where, where to where. And I would expect that from then the, um, um, the method work the same. If they don't, I would need to uh, uh, review my component to improve it so it's, um, uh, it's compatible with this kind of call. But I think it's important to be able to support this kind of thing, so you can, for instance, be able to store on S3 um, backups, 4D backups. For after the uh, on backup end, you can, for instance, imagine that uh, you take your backed up data and send it on to S3, for instance. Yeah, as Tim uh, said, it could be a great feature for a, a second version. Yeah, maybe yeah. <laughs> version two. Um, uh, perhaps another way to share the code where uh, some people might be able to branch it uh, would be uh, if you if you had it up on GitHub, and uh, I'd be happy to share a link to whatever wherever the code lands uh, yep. on 40 method, and uh, we can update this uh, the meeting post with uh, the actual source and the component, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's an idea. Of, okay, yeah, <laughs> that's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> An idea, however bad it may be. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm kidding. Yeah, no, it's uh, um, but yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for the demo. I, let me just check to make sure we haven't missed anyone's uh, questions. But um, we uh, we will uh, uh, put some links up to the uh, the the component, and uh, as usual, this demo will be available on YouTube after we're finished here. And uh, let me just kick it back to my slides. Um, uh, and again, there's a, there's a couple of links uh, to email Bruno about, uh, about this demonstration. And you can see uh, more information about him on, on LinkedIn. And uh, so we, uh, and here's, here's a little bit about his company, ANC Consulting. Uh, you may have to add a, a B in there, Bruno. What do you think? A, B, and C? 
consulting? Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe. It <laughs> yeah. was to be the first one on the uh, um, directory. So ah, okay. <laughs> it was a good, trick. A good, uh, yeah, good trick for that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, there's Bruno, and I think we've covered all of the uh, le question. Is that is that right? <laughs> um, but uh, a little bit about our, our next meeting. You can see the schedule for 4D Method at, on our website at uh, uh, 4dmethod.com slash schedule or in the, uh, the menu bar up there. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, Bruno Raymakers of HBO Latin America uh, who will demo his 4D list box component that increases your productivity in setting up and maintaining list boxes. Bruno, I believe you're, you're in the Hangout if you'd like to say a Quick uh, comment about that, or uh, Bruno Raymakers? No. Okay. Well, uh, the information is there, and we do have some dates open for uh, for 2017. Um, again, you can see those on the schedule, and if you have some ideas for a uh, for something you'd like to demo, uh, get in touch with us, and we'll uh, we'll try and get you on the schedule. Um, and uh, any other questions or comments? I'll just check one more time out there. Uh, let's see, no, just about where the component is, is obtained, um, but, uh, but that's about it, so thanks everyone, thanks for taking part in the, uh, in the Hangout, and thank you Bruno for the excellent demo, I'll definitely be checking that out. All right, thank you Brent, thank you Bruno, really good demo, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. Come Thank check you. it out at uh, 40method.com and all the rest of the content. All right, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.